and welcome to this special extra episode of Green Signals. With me, Steph Foster, out in the flatlands of the Fens, or as Nigel not very affectionately calls it, the swamps. <laughs> Indeed, and me, Nigel Harris, in Lincolnshire, which is a lovely cold autumn day with lots of good tints in the trees. Very nice too. It is. Normally, of course, Nigel's co-presenter is Richard Bowker. But because we're doing something a little bit different, we decided to do things a bit differently too. We did. We determined that Green Signals should be able to cover whatever we judge to be important. So every now and then we'll throw in one of these special extras so that we can talk about topical or interesting stuff that maybe sits a little outside of our mainstream of big national issues. Today's subject is one that we all felt deserved to be our first special episode. Indeed we did. On October the 18th, along with thousands of other people, I was very sad to hear that rail elder statesman Peter Norman Townend died just a day after the funeral of his wife of 73 years, Daphne. He was at the grand old age of 98. A railwoman whose career began in 1941 at the age of just 16, he was a premium apprentice for the London and North Eastern Railway at Doncaster Plant, as its headquarters was known locally. Now, Peter was undoubtedly best known for his time as Shedmaster at Top Shed at King's Cross during the last great days of steam in the later 1950s and early 1960s, when he ensured that steam went out with a really, really proud ending. Peter is not merely well known, but legendary to many people, on and around the railway. After steam went, he served the emerging modern industry with distinction too, as the King's Cross Divisional Traction and Rolling Stock Engineer looking after diesels. And he took early retirement in 1984 and went to live in Torquay with his wife Daphne. To the end of his days, Peter acted as a unique advisor to organisations including the National Railway Museum and the A1 Steam Locomotive Trust during its audacious building of tornado. No one, but no one understood the Gresley Pacific as a breed, in particular like Peter Townend. In his days at King's Cross, he had a squadron of 40 Pacifics in his care. Just think about that. It's amazing, isn't it? We are very proud to dedicate today's Green Signal special to Peter's life and achievements and throw at least a little light on why this mild-mannered and unique man will be such a well-remembered and highly respected figure on our railway. Nigel, you knew Peter personally, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was, I was very fortunate that way. Uh, we started writing back and forth when I was editor of Steam World way back in, in 1990. And Peter was always the complete gentleman in that very English sense of the word, measured, courteous, and above all, kind and generous with his time. He'd forgotten more about railways in general and locomotives in particular than I'll ever know. And yet, like his contemporary greats, John Bellwood and Dick Hardy, who is now joined, of course, beyond the pearly gates, Peter talked to you and not at you, and God forbid, never down to you. Um, he made you feel an equal, which was a real gift, and we had many lovely conversations. Um, I used to bump into him every year in the after the mid nineties when I was appointed on rail at um, at Rail Tex or Infra Rail. He'd retired in nineteen eighty four, but he never missed those shows, and he'd, I'd see him wandering around with a bag full of leaflets, keeping up with the latest in railway engineering. Um, he stayed overnight with me one night on his way to a, I think a gathering in Glasgow when I lived in St Michael's on wire in Lancashire. We, we sat in the local pub, The Grapes, and he nursed a bottle of Mackison. I didn't know they made it still even then. And he just told me some great stories. I had the good sense to shut up and listen. Um, I remember Bill Hull came up in conversation, the very famous driver, and Peter just shook his head slightly. And, and he did that with his finger and thumb. And he said, I had a file on Bill Hull that thick. He said, one more run by, and he'd have been off. He said, I could give you names of drivers you've never heard of, Nigel, who were, who were, you know, every bit as good and probably better. But just one little story about Peter that sums it up for me. We, we got onto Black Fives at one point. Um, and he made a comment which implied he wasn't that impressed. And I said, oh, come on, Peter, they'd, they'd do a, a reasonable job with anything that you hung on the back of the tender. And with a real twinkle in his eye, he says, what you're really saying, Nigel, is they didn't do anything that well. Um, and that was Peter all over. Um, just one last little thing. Um, Christmas won't be the same for me these days because there are two things that happened every year 
that told me it was Christmas. One, I'd be hearing Greg Lake on the radio singing, I believe in Father Christmas. And the other was one of Peter's Christmas cards would arrive, which always had on one of his pictures. I'm holding one now that's got Mallard on it. Um, and there was a, always a lovely little message inside. That was from, this one's from 2020. Um, but there'll be no more of those, sadly. Um, an era has passed for, for us all in that respect. And of course, he was a highly accomplished photographer in his own right. Well, it's such a lovely thing that you've got those Christmas cards still. And I'm sure you're going to keep hold of those as a, a real memento forever now, probably. Absolutely. I don't keep that much of stuff like that. And none of us keep that many Christmas cards, apart from the ones that are special to us. And they're very special to me. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Well, now, to really understand Peter's place in railway engineering and management history, we've invited some guests to join us today. First, we have Tony Streeter, who is an associate editor of railway preservation magazine Trackside. Tony also knew Peter and has written extensively about him for Steam World magazine. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Thank you. Tony, um, you have written extensively for Peter in, about Peter in Steam World magazine, and that was... That was a great visit that we made, wasn't it, back in 2017, and the pair of us went to see him at home in Torquay. Um, and I say talked him into, I don't think he really needed that much talking into it, doing some very big interviews with you over a couple of days, I think, that um, led to a, a series of, was it at least 11 or 12 parts in Steam World? best part of a year, certainly. I mean, you know, you said we wrote extensively. Um I ended up writing much more extensively than than I ever expected, and and that was all down to him. Um, in your intro, you said that he was always a gentleman and that he would always listen and never make you feel an idiot. And uh, even asking what would appear like silly questions, of which I had many, <laughs> you'd always get this very very gentlemanly answer, which would then get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and, and those pieces ran for nearly a year because of Peter, because Peter always added, he always came back, he had more to say. So those couple of days of extensive interviews then turned into hours of telephone conversations and all the rest of it as this incredible story of his life came out. It ended up being almost a, a kind of um, piecemeal authorised biography, didn't it? We never, neither he nor I ever said that, but I think that's how he ended up uh, viewing it. Yeah, that this was effectively his official story in the end. I mean, he had an extraordinary breadth of experience, didn't he? And things that he saw, which made both of our jaws drop when he told us about well, it. Well, who, who else, who else could you say, you know, born in 1925, witnessed the very dawn of the high-speed railway era in this country when... In 1935, as a 10-year-old, he stood on the platform at Doncaster and, and saw the very first run of the Silver Jubilee train and, and then ran all the way through, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but running one of the very most high-profile and difficult sheds in the country into the HST era and finally retiring in the 1980s. I mean, incredible breadth. It really was, wasn't it? And, um, and, a, and a railway family in every respect. We'll come on to his son, Mark, later. Um, but his his late wife Daphne, of course, had um, a real sort of um, distinctive railway background as well, didn't she? Well, of course, you see, he started at Doncaster, and as I understand it, much to the disapproval of his headmaster, he decided he wanted to join the the railway, and he became a premium apprentice in 1941. And, you know, just think about that for a second. That's the year that Gresley died. Yes. So. You know, he started on the railway then. He did fire watch on the roofs of Doncaster when the Luftwaffe, you know, was coming over bombing the place. And at the end of his uh, premium apprenticeship, which was in 1946, he went into the drawing office. Daphne was working in the drawing office and, uh, you know, that led them to get married in 1950, by which point he'd already moved on because he decided that the world of buttoned up shirts and pencils wasn't for him uh and and actually he wanted to go and get his hands dirty so he made a shift into the motive power uh, department even though that meant starting at the very bottom you know five years later of course back back then if you wanted a uh, uh, an extra drawing you had to trace one from the original and that's what Daphne did wasn't it she was a tracer that's what she did. And mm. also, I'm not sure how many people know this, but for example, the 
the B1460, you were talking about the, the Black Five, and in some senses, you could say that this was then the later LNER version of the Black Five, although it I'm was. not sure, not sure he would have necessarily no, accepted no. that. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, he did some of the drawings for that locomotive. So, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of legacy, that may not be the important part of the legacy, but even at that point, when he started his career in the way that we would recognise it now, you know, he already had more behind him than a lot of people would have ever achieved ever. Well, absolutely, and um, so he he, um, he he moved over into the 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 the, 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 the grubby but intimate, in, effectively much more to him attractive world of motive power management. And it's very clear. Although, as I'm sure you'll be able to echo, he was always very modest about it. But uh, it was very clear that somebody saw something in Peter Norman Townend immediately, um, because very soon he was moving around the system uh, as a, effectively as a relief shed master. Yeah. Um, you know, he ran Melton Constable, which is quite a famous shed uh, over in, in East Anglia and, and various others as well. Um, and, you know, people say he was 31, but I think he wasn't even quite 31 when he landed the the job at, at Top Shed, you know, taking over King's Cross with Royal Trains, non-stop workings every day in the summer or whatever up to, to, to Edinburgh, a thousand staff at a really, really difficult time for the railways. You know, when you had staff shortages, you had coal problems, Clean Air Act was coming in. Uh, and you'd have been working with hard-bitten railwaymen, you know, who'd done 30 years on the railway. And, and here was this guy who, who was just 30, and he was your new boss. The railway was very good at that, though, wasn't it? I mean, I re if you read Steam in the Blood by Dick Hardy, who was a mm. contemporary apprentice with Peter mm -hmm. at Doncaster, I think Dick went to Shedmaster to Woodford Hulse when he was 26. Yeah. Um, Peter was 23 when they sent him to Melton Constable. So mm. you were right. They were, they were good talent spotters, weren't they? They really, they um, really were. Uh, and clearly they had got it right with Peter as as we're about to uh, discuss, I'm sure, with some of his biggest legacies. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, his crowning achievement was obviously getting the very best out of steam in its dying days, allowing the, the, the Pacifics to really match diesel timings when those early machines um, weren't all that reliable. And it just wouldn't have been possible without Peter, would it? Tell, tell us a bit about the, the tale of the, uh, the, the, the double Carl chaps, because there's one or two aspects about that he mentioned that made the pair of us jaws drop when he just mentioned uh, it in passing. Uh, you know, absolutely. I'm sure this has got to be one of everybody's uh, favourites. Um, uh, and you reminded me of this the other day, this sort of that uh, the decision was taken locally. Locally. Um, <laughs> you know, which, of course, is code for none of the official processes were working. So we basically just bulldozed this through. Um, and I went back and looked at some of the notes that, that Peter had done for those those interviews. Um, and it was very clear that he had tried through official channels over a number of years to get the car chaps fitted to those locomotives. And he was basically thwarted at every turn uh, and, he, and he didn't give up. And, and in the end, uh, you know, he did manage to bulldoze that through on the basis of, of saving coal. It was about money saving. Uh, yeah, it was about between five and eight pounds of coal per mile, mm. which doesn't sound a lot. But on a Pacific going 400 miles... Um, to Edinburgh, it's, I think it's about the thick end of a ton, isn't it? So it was the thick end of a ton of coal a day in each direction on the Pacifics. That would be a very valuable uh, saving. But even so, we're talking about the late 50s and the early 60s, very late in the mm -hmm. day for Steve. But he just didn't give up, did he? He just didn't give up. And, of course, you know, he had the experience as well because he went out firing locos during the war um, so he knew how hard it was to be a fireman on a big, heavy train with a locomotive not in the best condition, running on poor coal. On a and single exhaust. A single exhaust, yeah. And, and of course, at that time, they had very limited uh, experience, but one or two locos did have the double exhaust even then. Um, so, so he knew the difference. But I suspect that although it went through on coal saving and therefore on financial grounds, what he was really interested in is what you alluded to a moment ago, which was the performance. It was making the things reliable and it was making them perform well. He was, and he was, he had, 
as you said, he was just completely objective and he didn't care who it was. If somebody said something to him which he didn't really agree with or didn't stand up in his definite engineering terms, he'd tell you. I mean, I once commented about, asked him about the, the difference in performance of the single exhaust on the A3s. Um, and, you know, as we all remember, the late Andrew Dow wanted to fly in Scotsman to have a single exhaust. And, of course, Pegler, when he bought it, had it converted back to single exhaust. I remember Peter looked at me with his words dripping with disdain once. He said, Nigel, he said, you've done a bit of firing. Why on earth would you want to modify a locomotive so it performs much less well than it can do? He said, especially out on the main line where you need reliability and efficiency. He said, it makes no sense to think of a single exhaust on an A3. And that was it, end of conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, uh, he, interestingly to me, at least, he, he made the point that whilst Pegler converted the locomotive back to single chimney form at the moment he bought it, basically, uh, Pegler had been on the Eastern Region Board at the time that these in, uh, discussions, arguments had been going on. And he said that, in fact, Pegler had supported the fitting of the double chimneys. So, you know, perhaps even Alan Pegler realised that for the day-to-day -day railway, it was the right thing to do. I, either way, you know, Peter got it through anyway. And he, of course, continued long after he retired from steam and long after he retired from uh, BR in 1984. He took early retirement and moved to, to Torquay, where you and I went to see him. But he was, he was never more than a phone call away from anybody that wanted any help with any aspect history, engineering, didn't matter, of an East Coast Pacific. And to me, on a personal basis, that's what we've now lost. Um, you know, you said about Christmas cards earlier, and I have Christmas cards that I will treasure. But what I've really been able to treasure over the years is knowing that if I had a question about a locomotive that was running today, uh, or a historical question, I could just ring him up. And there would always be an answer. And I don't think I ever rang him to get the answer. Oh, well, I'm not sure about that. I'll come back to you. The answer was always instantly there and, and followed up by supplementary information for all the questions that you hadn't actually asked yet. And then a whole load of other stuff as well, which you couldn't tear yourself away from. Because once you started talking, if you'd any sense, you, as I said before, you shut up and listened. Um, I can hear it between your lines, Tony. You also clearly thought he was a, one, of, one of life's gentlemen. Absolutely. To me, he was, you know, he was the epitome of an old fashioned gentleman. You know, word is my bond, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, modest, polite. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, it didn't matter if you asked a silly question, you know, you'd always get a reasonable answer, although you could also discern quite clearly uh, that, you know, behind the mask, he, he was perhaps thinking something, something slightly different. And, you know, I shall hugely miss that. I shall I hugely miss the opportunity just to talk to him and just to listen. Well, as you say, you know, somebody who stood on the platform in in the mid thirties and watch silver link go by with the first silver Jubilee. We've lost a, an incredible link with the past. And of course that was the dawn of the high speed age in, in the UK. Of course, one of the things Tony was that although the double cowl chaps work wonderfully um, in boosting the efficiency of the A3s and the A4s, the much softer exhaust led to drifting smoke problems, obscuring the driver's view. It did, and they didn't have a solution for it. And, uh, you know, characteristically, it was Peter possibly thinking slightly unconventionally, certainly thinking unconventionally in terms of how to get this done, uh, who provided the solution. He, he was quite a keen photographer, and he, he travelled extensively in Europe, and he'd taken a picture of a locomotive at Cologne, which had smoke deflectors on it that he thought would be perfect. Um, and the solution was simply to send this photograph to Doncaster and say, make this, uh, which they then did. And the, the German style smoke deflectors were run out across the fleet. Of course, they're very divisive, aren't they? People either love them or hate them. Personally, I think they look magnificent. And whenever I see the A3 front end, I always think of Peter and I certainly will know. Tony Streeter, thank you very much. Now I'm delighted to welcome a former director of the National Railway Museum, Steve Davies. Steve also knew Peter pretty well as a result of his help for both the NRM with the very challenging major overhaul of Flying Scotsman and the A1 Trust with Tornado. Steve, welcome. Thank you, Steph. It's great to see you again. 
Yes, you Steve. Too. Welcome. So Good to see you. Um, Peter, very sad news. Um, when did you first come across him? Um, I, I'd heard of him, but I, I never met him until I got to the National Railway Museum. Um, funnily enough, I'd, I'd, I was reading his book when I was at the Museum of Science Industry just before going to the NRM as part of my preparation because um, clearly I'd done a lot of reading about railways over the years. But when I asked one or two people, one of the best people to read about to prepare me for York and uh, Peter Townend was up there at the top of the list. So I'd read about him, but um, our first contact was when he got wind of the great gathering that we delivered the celebrate Mallard 75. And he, he wrote to me and um, in quite effusive terms, actually. And, um, and then that triggered a meeting. I remember that, Steve, because um, we, we are good friends, so you won't mind me saying this. I thought you were completely barking when you first told me about that idea, getting all six surviving Air Force together, especially considering as two of them, I think, were in the US at the time. Well, but uh, you pulled it off. Well done. Yeah, well, um, there are a lot of people out there, particularly in the chain of command, as it were, saying that this is this will never happen. And I'm afraid that the more you tell me it can't happen, the more it's going to happen. Um, looking back, I think that if I'm going to be remembered for anything, it probably will be that event because it it'll never be repeated. And it was it was so so special, and it made even more special with uh, Peter coming up. And um, I managed to get a, a very cherished photograph of he and I stood in front of Mallard, um, which you might be able to reproduce. So that uh, and um, you know I'm not normally lost for words, but I. There was always a sense that I was in the presence of two great machines, Mallard and Peter there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and he, he witnessed the event and clearly thoroughly enjoyed it. That was that was a good news story. Um, if we might turn to Flying Scotsman, which was a rather less good news story for you at the time, with the incredibly challenging overhaul that seemed to go on forever, the never-ending overhaul. Well, um, we, yeah, it, Peter was uh, pretty help. Peter was pretty helpful with that, wasn't he? He was, yeah, and <clears throat> and in particular on a, I mean, a, clearly the conversation was on the back of what was going on with Mallard seventy five, and I do remember uh, some people pressing me to put Mallard back into steam, and I said, I think I've got enough on my plate with Flying Scotsman. Actually, uh, I can't, I can't, I can't repatriate six A fours and fix one of them, and and and, but. Talking to Peter, he we got onto the subject of single chimney or double chimney. And um, the decision had been taken before I arrived at York that it would go into double chimney. But I just thought I'd, and I remember having this conversation with you, actually, Nigel, um, about, you know, was this the right decision? Because what it would do is limit the livery options. Um, and therefore, the engine couldn't refresh itself. And, and I was thinking... Do we want it in apple green? Do we want BR green? Could it go in blue? And so on and so forth. But, and given that the NRM at the time was saying that what we're not going to do is run this thing into the ground, uh, was power output an issue? Anyway, talking to Peter, he said, my advice, young man, at which point he was back on my Christmas card list, calling me young man. <laughs> my advice, young man, is uh, double chimney. Um, it'll, it'll certainly... Uh, cope with any vagaries in fuel quality, uh, and uh, it, it'll, it'll it'll lend itself to getting you out of trouble when you've got to make up time. And um, and I thought, well, if he's offering me that advice, and 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 that's exactly the line you took, Nigel. I don't know if you recall that conversation, um, but um, I think it was the wise one. As a, but albeit, we are stuck with British Railways Green, aren't we? And uh, the um, elephant ears. I I did I. I did repeat that advice, uh, Steve, and the key word there is repeat, uh, because I'd had that conversation with Peter a few times. Oh, really? And he, oh, absolutely. He yeah. was absolutely clear that you would be sort of out of your mind, really, though he didn't put it in those terms, if you wanted to put a Gresley Pacific back to a single chimney, um, because he, he just knew they would perform much better as double chimneys, which they did, which they there absolutely was, no, there was did, one... thanks to him. There was one thing I always wanted to ask him, but never got round to it, and that was, why on earth did he? I, I could see the logic of smoke deflectors, but why on earth did he go for those 
whopping great German elephant ears. Had he tried all the other ideas and they hadn't worked and this one just, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I, I mean, I, I love German steam locos. Um, but uh, and in fact, those um, smoke deflectors are the same type that you get on a class 52 Kriegs lock. But uh, uh, we'll never know the answer unless somebody does know the answer. Well, Tony Streeter told us in his interview that Peter just sent a picture of a Pacific at Cologne to Doncaster and said, make a pair of these. Um, so the, the answer is probably simply he knew that they worked um, and he probably just quite liked them and fancied doing it. <laughs> and, of course, the LNER had a history of experimenting with all sorts of funny little winglets either side of the chimney or yeah. all sorts of smoke deflectors. But, I mean, some people absolutely hate them. Um, I actually think they look magnificent. I was editing Steam Railway at the time they were first fitted, um, way back in the in the nineties, and um, it really divided opinion. It was a well, bit like it, when City of Truro was painted black for an April Fool. Oh, you know, there's, yes. It was completely that. binary. P binary. Yeah. People loved them or hated them. Well, I suppose the the final word on the smoke deflectors has to go uh, to the driver. They're not there for aesthetic reasons. They're there to lift the smoke. It's as simple as that. It's to improve sighting it, for the driver. And if the drivers think they work, well, who are we to argue? It's always a good idea for the driver to be able to see where he was going, particularly in an era before a lot of AWS and there were sighting of distant signals in particular. Yeah. Um, was an utterly fundamental thing. So he offered you lots of advice on, on that, and he went on to offer even more advice and still did to the end, I understand, with the A1, which it's worth mentioning, although Peter's regarded, and he is, of course, the world expert on Gresley Pacifics. If you read his book, his favourite position Pacifics were the A1s. He said they were more efficient, they worked better, uh, and sort of pound for pound spent, they delivered much better value than anything else. So he was a huge fan of the A1. Well, they were, and of course, the uh, I think the mileage run between major overhauls was the greatest mm. of any LNER Pacific. I mean, P Peter turned up for the inaugural A1 Trust uh, meeting at the Great Northern Hotel at King's Cross in spring of 91, and um, that did two things. First of all, um, and it triggered his subsequent further involvement, but what it did was, of course, it gave the Trust significant early kudos uh, because if this great man was associating himself with the project, well, that's a feather in the cap. But he um, he tackled, I wasn't there, but this is quite often related within the trust. He tackled an interesting comment made by a, a, a nameless member of the public who said, what is the point of building an A1 when there were such rough riders? At which point Peter jumped to his feet and said, I'd like to counter that. He said, now this is where you'll, you'll laugh at this point, Nigel. He said, there were no... They were no rougher than Britannia's or Black Fives. Granted, <laughs> they weren't as smooth as an A4, but actually, uh, at King's Cross, we did a lot of work on the springing, which solved the problem. And subsequently, of course, um, he, he was advising the trust. He was pressing for roller bearings, which is what people wanted to do. There was only a couple of the original A1s had roller bearings, but it, it made sense, and he was he was pushing that um the he, he subsequently uh, did a cab ride um on the, i think the torbay express and uh, wrote a very interesting uh, summary of his experience and he was absolutely delighted because he felt that all of the uh, the issues that people had and there's a lot of myth of course around about, uh, around steam engines and riding and so on but he was genuinely one of those guys who had experienced them extensively, and he knew what he was talking about. But he, he felt that with Tornado, we'd crack the problem. And um, That's really good. And he, 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 he was one of our vice presidents, and I, as chairman, um, I give the, uh, the president, David Champion, and the vice presidents a personal direct update of what's going on, on a, one -to -one, on a sort of one-to-four basis, as it were, um, rather than assume that they're picking it up from various correspondence. And, and Peter would always reply, and then and, and later, of course, Mark would reply on his behalf because we, we sensed that he was ailing. But nevertheless, there's something quite magical about pressing the send button to know that, that the last shed master of King's Cross is at the far end 
waiting to read your message. It's oh gosh, we we've lost a, a link we've lost with... a we've lost a champion, haven't we? Absolutely, real link with history. Um, and every now and then he drops something into the conversation that that made you do a real double oh, take. Um, I mean, well, the um, his comment that you mentioned to me a while ago about Cock of the North, the original one. So, well, I just talked to him about the P2, and uh, I said, oh, the, I bet there's nobody around who ever experienced these things in their original form. And he just said, I did. I said, what? He said, yeah, I, I cabbed Cock of the North before the rebuild. Yes, uh, I was quite impressed, uh, just south of Doncaster. And I thought, my goodness, I'm, I could just reach out and touch history here. Um, That's absolutely but- it. Isn't it? It's just, uh, and we've sadly, I, 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 I'm sure someone can contradict me, but I, I look out there, and I'm not entirely sure there's anybody of his stature and magnitude in terms of modern, re- relatively modern steam railway history left. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but um, he's certainly the last of what I call the railway heritage household names. Absolutely. As as you said, his books were sort of pretty legendary, Top Shed and East Coast Pacifics. Um, they were sort of required reading along with Dick Hardy's Steam in the Blood, and he was very much of that that sort of era. So um, we will not see his like again, Steve. No. Um, but look, look, just look at look at another sort of um, aspect of the his appointment at King's Cross. Could you imagine a motive power depot of that significance in the modern age being entrusted to a 30-year-old. And he was. Uh, what an extraordinary thing. And I saw the photograph of him talking to a driver in the obituary, accompanying the obituary in the Telegraph. And he wasn't yes, just a smart... looking at it now, actually. He wasn't just a smart man. He was visually smart. I mean, look at that. Look at the cut of that suit. You know, look look at the... What? There's a, that he just... He exudes professionalism and quality, and um, I just hope that those two characteristics aren't lost forever. But as you said, a 30 or 31-year-old in charge at Top Shed, a thousand, a thousand hard-bitten North Londoners, all sort of looking at this young whippersnapper and thinking, go on then, show me, Gov. And he did. Yeah. He did, he did. Okay. And he wasn't... Yeah, he, he didn't just accept the railway's fate. He was determined that his engines would go out on a high. <coughs> uh, and uh, what, what more could you expect? What more could you want? He was he was an incredible man, and he had a real impact on, on the services, given that he, his tuning in the Pacifics enabled him to perform in diesel schedules when the early diesels weren't that reliable. And that's just one of many legacies. Anyway, look, Steve, we could talk all day. Sadly, we can't do that. But thank you for your time. Um, and I'm sure, well, I hope our paths will cross again soon. They will. Okay. Yeah, all thank the way you back, so Nigel. much, Steve. And it was fantastic. And I love, I loved your Cock of the North story. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. I'll, I'll dine out on that for years. All right, Steph, great seeing you again. Thanks, Thanks Steve. By the way, take care, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Finally, we wanted to tell you a bit, not just about the railway man, but the man himself. Who was the man behind the awesome reputation as a husband, as a father, as a man. And we felt there was no better person to help us do that than his son, Mark, who followed his dad onto the railway as a signalling engineer, initially at the Western Region Drawing Office at Reading after a three-year training scheme, then moving on to consultancy and finally to Network Rail, where Mark served the railway as a signalling asset renewals and enhancements engineer, assessing condition, then proposing renewal projects on the former Southern Region. He's now concentrating on heritage projects for the South Devon Railway. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me. Mark, it's it's a pleasure, and obviously we must kick off by expressing our, the condolences of the whole Green Signals team on the loss of both your dad and mum in a remarkably short period of time. So thanks, um, Nigel. Yeah, thanks for doing this in those circumstances. I could imagine you've got plenty more on on your mind but i think when we you and i talked about doing this we agreed he was it was worth a salute and a tribute um at this point. Yeah. absolutely yeah. so look um you followed your dad onto the railway as a signaling engineer or well, not as a, a loco engineer 
Um, was it always preordained that Ed preordained that you'd end up on the railway? Because I was reading the script that you kindly sent that uh, from from the funeral, and I was noticing your sister's words that she said that uh, wherever you happen to go anywhere in the world, by a weird coincidence, it always seemed to end up near a steam railway. I, I mean, as far as um, you know, having a a deep interest in railways. I don't think I had I had much choice to be honest when I was a child. Um, so no, I I I I I very soon developed a very keen interest in the in the whole railway scene. Um, I think um, I was um, well. I could have I could have possibly gone into to the locomotive side. Um, I felt I wanted to try something different. Okay. Um, and um, signalling seemed to me um, a very good broad subject because it touches on all the other disciplines in, you know, working out schemes and whatnot. So um, I thought signalling was a good choice. Um, I had a, I had a, I, I also had an offer uh, for a civil engineering job as well at, um, at Watford, um, uh, which I considered. But um, the S and T pay was better, and they offered me the ch- they offered me the chance to do part of my training scheme down in the West Country, which suited me because I had my gran lived in Paynton at the time. Okay. So the first nine months of my um, apprenticeship, if you like, um, I spent uh, living with my gran in Paynton and working with the track with the um signaling gangs uh, around the extra area okay. which was um, an interesting experience and that that was of course right at the end of the mechanical signaling period down here just before exeter signal box um, came into uh, use in the mid 80s I would imagine that your dad was just pleased that you'd ended up on the railway because I've known some railway families where the children have rebelled against it mm. because they, they lived it in their childhood and, and didn't want anything to do with trains. So I would, I would imagine that he, and indeed your mum, as a, um, a, a company a servant. railway to, um, employee as well, of course, yeah. We're, we're yeah. pleased you'd followed in those sort of footsteps. On, in the family business, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I did... <clears throat> I must admit, I very quickly wondered whether I'd made the right decision because um, th- th- this was around the time of the Serpil report and all, all kinds right, of things yeah. going on in um, in the um, the uh, that era of um, politics and um, <laughs> and affairs at those at that time, you know. So um, I did wonder whether I'd really made the right decision at all. <laughs> So, so he did. He did give you plenty of railway experience as a, as a child growing up, even to the extent of, uh, I mean, my dad used to do this, and it would be never allowed now, would it? And that's lugging you the the kids along to work when uh, when you were called out on a Saturday or whatever. I can remember in the engineering workshops with my dad, he was in die casting, mm. sort of running around in ways which would give health and safety people a fit now. And some of the things that you've told us that your dad took you along with mm. would would never be allowed now, would it? Well, no, I, I, you know, I think, I think it was a, I think to be honest, it was rather reluctant. It was he was doing it rather reluctantly in a difficult situation because he couldn't leave me at home when he'd been called out. Um, couldn't leave me at home alone. So, um, you know, I think it was the sort of, um, you know, the best of, uh, you know, the best best thing to do at the time from his point of view. But yeah, absolutely, I mean. Um, I mean, I think the idea was I should have stayed in the car, to be honest. But, <laughs> but in, 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 in certainly on one memorable occasion, he, he popped me in the class thirty-one that was hauling the engineering train. <laughs> so um, I had I, I rode up and down the site all day um, <laughs> with the driver, which was great fun, actually. Must have been a great adventure for a for a young lad to do, and it doubtless, was, yeah. doubtless, your dad had had a quick word with the driver, stick him in the second man seat, and just keep an eye on him. That's about right. Yeah. <laughs> So, but there was lots of other railways in Switzerland and Europe, and it was it gave you plenty of exposure to the trains in that respect. By the sound of it, absolutely, it was um, it was rare not to find a railway somewhere when we went on our family holidays. The you know you, know, you, you might go a few days without um, seeing a railway, but then one day you might just walk round a corner and there's a steam mountain railway. Um, <laughs> They're all over the, the place, town or something. You know, so it was. It was that <clears throat> you could see that the the plans were made um, specifically to include railways in the in the itinerary, shall we say? So, were you aware of his his, his sort of locomotive experience and the the sort of great work he was doing at the time, or? 
I think I, I soon became certainly went certainly um, once he started writing the first of his books, which of course was Top Shed, and he was writing that in the early 1970s, um, which is when I'd be, um, you know, under 10 really at the time when he started that. And I'd would, I would say that um, that's when I became aware of the, um, that's when I started to become aware of um, the scale of his achievements. Um, yeah, that's what I meant, really, yeah. So I, I, I've got a, a copy here I've been doing a oh, bit of... first edition, yeah. A bit of homework on. Uh, um, they'd never put a picture like that on a cover now, would they? With no, three, no. Th three but it's engines. spectacular, isn't it? I, it's based, I think it's based on an LNER publicity photo. I think it is. Uh, it is yeah. I don't know where the painting is, which is interesting, because um, I think Ian Allen arranged for that to be um, created. Um, but we never saw the original painting itself. I assume it's an Ian Allen asset or probably one of their directors or something. <laughs> It'll be on somebody's lounge wall somewhere. Yeah, no or, doubt. <laughs> right. But, you know, so your dad's work clearly inspired you, um, mm -hmm. both both in terms of what he did and, and, and how he did it. Were you? How did you become aware of his sort of that very methodical patient but utterly determined uh, well, approach he, he, to engineering that got the double exhaust fitted because he, I mean, he literally was just unstoppable, wasn't he? Yeah. I mean, it, it was, um, I think, I think he had an awful lot of support. I think that's, um, that's something certain, you know, certain um, senior managers like uh, Fines, for instance, were very supportive of his work um, at that time. Um, and um, I think that helped. Um but yeah, no doubt about it. He was um, he was uh, single handedly determined to get it through, to get to get the the, the proposal through, um, and which he succeeded. Um, I mean, first on the A4s and then later on the A3s, which immediately threw up that problem with the soft exhaust and um, uh, forward visibility. And um, it, it, even he was remarkably surprised when um, he, he suggested the German style and, and um, well, they asked him, well, can you give us an example? So he just gave them a picture. Of, um, he gave Doncaster a picture of an 01 Pacific in Cologne station, I believe. Um, and sort of the following week, they had um, they had a drawing knocked up and um, a prototype manufactured and uh, just remarkable. I mean, he was utterly... <clears throat> bowled over by that because he was used to the you know the interminable bureaucracy of br organizing trials and you know you'd have taken three years to sort of come up with an official design like that but he managed to do it in a matter of days almost it he was, was um quite he was remarkable very... He was very good at short-circuiting the system, wasn't exactly, he? Exactly, yeah, yeah. He, he told me one wonderful story when he came to see me in Lancashire once. He told, We were talking about the A4s and the, the, the middle big ends and the, mm. the overheating issues, and he said, he said there wasn't really an overheating issue. He said, I, he said at, at one time at King's Cross, he said, I, I left instructions that the middle big end on whatever A4 was having it looked at, I'm supposed to be having it looked at that particular mm -hmm. night, I wanted the brasses put in on my desk, and I used to leave a copy of the Daily Mirror open on my desk. I thought it was interesting. What did you want to check them for? He said, I didn't, but if they were on my desk, I knew they'd been out. Ah! <laughs> Clever. <laughs> which was, which I thought was a really great story and uh, a slightly unorth unorthodox approach to engineering, but taking into account what happened in the rough and tumble of... Uh, of mm. everyday life on a, on an engine shed. Absolutely, yeah. And then he transferred it all into all that enthusiasm, although you say he didn't enjoy it as much, with the diesels after steam went. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think he was, I think he was, um, you know, he was upset at the end of steam. I, I, I think there's no doubt about that. Um, and, um, you know, he was still, he was still, uh, I mean, and so were a lot of other people were, 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 um, uh, moot, you know, it, it was there were ideas that that you could keep the V2s going and maybe fit some more with the double kill chaps and and whatnot. But of course, eventually they did get on top of all the problems of the incoming diesels. I mean, not 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 least with father's help um, in his new engineering job after um, after Top Shed. Um, but you know, eventually sufficient that there was sufficient fleet numbers and availability to. Um, take over the remaining steam work. 
so you know reliably um so you know eventually steam had to go but um yeah he definitely applied all that same um methodology drive um to uh his new job uh looking after the diesel fleets but he must have been incredibly proud i wish i'd asked him a bit more about it now when we'd talked that the fact that uh, what he'd done to the pacifics enabled them to run in deltic timings i know in, it's in remarkable, those, I mean, it? absolutely remarkable gresley must have been looking down from his cloud thinking oh my goodness you know there you go <laughs> I mean, wow. did he ever talk about much about that sort of transition era much um uh, not, not, not. Well, I mean, only, only in terms of the facts of, um, you know, they had. Because um, I, I wasn't sure what job he'd moved into exactly straight away after Top Shed, and I don't know whether he was a spare man or something for a while. But I know eventually he became the assistant maintenance engineer um, uh, for the Kings Cross Division. Uh, whether that was immediate on the closure of. Um, top shed or or sometime after i don't know but he certainly stayed um if you like in charge of the depot um from great northern house but also looking after other depots on the division so um if you like his um methodologies and um uh style would be available to other 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 um, other depots um, in the division, basically. Um, One thing he did have a regret about, and he raised it with me a couple of times, and he was quite irritated about it. He said, you know, Nigel, he said, given how important Top Shed was, there isn't so much as a street, an alleyway, or anywhere in that area which is named Top Shed Passage or whatever as, as, as a link with a pass, and he was clearly quite aggrieved about it. I think he'd written to the local authorities a number of times. Yeah, there was... Um, he was actually... <clears throat> um, I think, was it Gordon Pettit was involved um, with... Um, I think they were looking at um, trying to come up with some form of commemoration yeah. for the... Um, for the locomotive depot um maybe some kind of plaque or memorial mm. or something like that in the king's cross area in this the good yard development essentially um because there are a lot of new streets that could easily have been um uh you know um in time but that, they'd already made the choice on the street names i believe um and some of them have sort of railway themes, I believe. Some of the new street names have certain railway themes, but non-specifically um, anything to do with um, the steam depot. Which, um, as you say, it's a it's a great uh, it's a great shame. I mean, obviously, the site itself um, is now subsumed beneath all the flyovers and junctions of um, uh, of HS1 and the connection into um, St Pancras isn't it so, it is indeed um, you know this, <clears throat> if you if you look if you look at an old old map overlaid with a new one you can see that the the depot itself was right underneath the um, the main line to Paris which is uh, <laughs> There you go. An interesting. Uh... <laughs> but look, like Steph said, we could talk about this all day, but we, we we must move to a close. But I just wanted to share with our listeners um, of of the podcast that wonderful quote that you uh, you passed to us that came from one former colleague mm. from from the diesel period, actually. That's right. Yeah. When he yeah. said, "Your father had a profound effect on how the King's Cross locomotives were maintained for a quarter of a century." For me. He stands as an engineer who made a lasting difference and also who encouraged M and E people, mechanical and electrical engineering people, to both seek the best as well as to be the best. That's a really fantastic tribute, isn't it? It is. I thought that was fantastic. Um and um it, it just summarizes it, it just summarizes his style, doesn't it, really? I mean you 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 know, um I, I think it just um it really does capture the man. Um, it, uh, professionally i would say definitely yeah he always was um an engineer an engineer's engineer wasn't he that's a good uh, way of describing it isn't it it's like a musician's musician isn't it well, he was very, <laughs> he was yeah. very measured even when something cropped up in engineering terms he didn't like you know he was halfway through the second sentence before you realized actually what he'd said and he wasn't being complimentary you know he was very <laughs> he was very polite in it all but it sounds like he was a great dad as well and um you know the, the man behind the engineer was uh 
pursued life with the same sort of drive and everything else. Mm, definitely. I think after when he after when he retired, um, because in his um, you know in his working career, he never really had a had time to travel much beyond Europe. Um, on family holidays and such like. Um, but it was once he retired that he started traveling extensively. Um, and I do remember when um, I do remember when I used to call home from Reading and um, mum, mum wouldn't travel with him because uh, she wouldn't fly, which is um, it, and she wasn't that interested, but that was, that was fine. So dad went off on his, on his trips and mum stayed at home. And often I used to ring home at weekends and, so where's dad this week then? And oh right, he's in South Africa, or he's in in the United States, or he's in <laughs> Japan. <laughs> this, uh, so he, he um, I think he, um, you know, he sort of set out to visit all this. And funnily enough, he managed to sort of um, encounter a lot of um, a lot of his former colleagues, or some former colleagues and friends and people he'd met um, previously, actually running railways out there. So he got you know, personal guided tours and trips in uh, inspection saloons and cab passes and things like that in far-flung places on his travels. When we, when I was editing Steam Railway in 1994 and we ran Union and South Africa out to King's Cross for the first A4 in 30 years, we got the Intercity Saloon on the back mm. and I, I invited your dad, Andrew Dow, Dick Hardy, um, a former Top Shed fireman called Frank Mays, um, and one or two others, and I, I remember just sitting and standing in the corner of that saloon and just listening to Hardy and your dad um, just chewing the fat about East Coast matters of, of the past, and it was a real privilege. But there mm. you go. What a man and what a life. Thank you, Nigel. He, he was a, a, a great father and a great engineer, in my view. Well, a son could pay no greater tribute to his dad, could he? Thanks, Nigel. Not at all. Thank you, Mark. We hope you enjoyed our final tribute to Peter as much as Nigel and I have enjoyed making it. We did. That's about it for this special extra episode, celebrating the life of such a unique man who will be very much missed way beyond his family, to whom we send our heartfelt condolences. We do. Thanks once again to Tony Streeter, Steve Davies and Mark Townend for sharing their memories and tributes with us. You can find a collection of fantastic photographs from Peter's life on our blog at greensignals.org. Do let us know what you thought of today's show on at Green Signalers on X, the new Twitter, together with any suggestions of things you think we should cover, particularly if there are any other special episodes you have in mind, because we'd Good really point. like to do some more of these, wouldn't we? We would, we would, we would. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe on podcast platforms and on YouTube it really does make a difference to us and ensures more people get to find out about Green Signals. But for now, that's it. Do join us again for our next regular episode, which will be published on Wednesday. But for now, from Nigel and me, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>